Okay, so in terms of the technology, I just want to point out we, we do, this is the back channel for the, the meeting, so anybody that's joining remotely is able to post to this feed via Twitter uh, using the hashtag OERU16. For those of you here in the meeting who uh, don't use Twitter, you would be able to create an account uh, on the meeting website at OERU.org at meetings.overu.org. You'll see there's a little hit uh, graphic there. And if you click there, you, you can uh, register that yeah. account. And yeah. uh, that will enable you also to yeah. post yeah. to that feed. So there are two ways in which you can actually interact with that feed. And we keep that feed live uh, throughout the meeting for anybody on the app, you know, remotely who wants to contribute, uh, is able to do so. So the two ways of posting there, either via the meeting site or if you're a Twitter user, using the hashtag over 16. So I thought I'd just point that out. Uh, we are, in terms of navigating the agenda, you will see here that is the partners meeting. Um, there's a high level summary of the meeting schedule for day one and day two. And then if you go back to the main menu, uh, you will see the detailed agenda for each day. And if you click on this bar at the top, uh, day one, it gives the breakdown of the sessions for, uh, you know, for day one. And we're currently in the setting the scene mode. Okay. So what I'd like to just cover in this session very briefly uh, are the aims of the meeting. And um, you will be able to follow these links from the meeting agenda, Moving on to the aims. I've just got a bit of a latency back here on my desktop. Video recording will come through in a moment. Okay, so we will be back live again. Uh, <laughs> You can follow the uh, from your own um, devices. You'll be able to see the, the, the aims listed there. 
I'm just having a few problems here from the podium. But um, the, the key aims of this meeting are to review our progress uh, over the current year. Now, uh, the current year is we're in our third quarter, so we've still got a quarter to go, right? I have to say, uh, where we're at at this stage of the development uh, pro uh, process is actually quite good. I think we're going to exceed a good number of our targets that we set at the previous partners meeting. So that's all good. The key focus of this meeting, of, of course, is to focus on our operational priorities for 2017, which is really focusing on the launch of the OERU first year of study. Um, what we also do at these meetings is we follow, we follow an evergreen strategic planning process. We are currently within the 2015 to 2017 strategic plan of the OERU. And part of what we do at the, these uh, international meetings is recalibrate our strategic objectives for the 2017 year. So we input into that process to help establish our KPIs for 2017, which is uh, part of what we do. The other component which is quite important is we need to start preparing for our next strategic plan, the 2018 to 2020 strategic plan. And uh, true to OERU traditions, uh, we do conduct a rather comprehensive open consultation in developing these plans. And we will be doing a little bit of planning around the thinking for uh, launching that consultation in 2017. <coughs> I'm just going to shut this down here. Okay. The other issue which is quite important about OERU meetings, if you haven't been to an OERU meeting before, this is not a conference. Right? It's not a conference. It is a planning meeting, and I think the best way of des describing these OERU meetings is, in fact, it's a planning sprint. What we attempt to do is to generate a first draft, if you will, of key components of our plan for the 2017 year. And because we are radically open uh, and transparent, we record all our uh, interactions in the wiki and other documents which then becomes the first draft of this planning process, which we then refine in the coming weeks, uh, which, which follow the meeting. And of course, everybody being, uh, open, being a wiki and it's open and it's transparent, everybody is able to contribute uh, to that planning process. So uh, a couple of principles for the, if this is your first OERU meeting, uh, we build on decisions uh, that we've you know, that we've taken and work that has been done to date. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a very significant component of our sort of our open model in terms of how we work. We work on a model of rough consensus and running code. What that means is we, uh, we, we focus on implementation. And so the folk that are sitting around the table helping us take immediate implementation decisions are the folk that inform this process, right? And then we take those decisions and we implement. So we don't go back to the decisions that were taken in 2011 and uh, you know, re reconfigure those decisions. We work with what we've done and where we're at in the process in terms of how the OERU works. Our focus is on taking decisions for implementing the OERU first year of study next year. Um, we can, of course, identify strategic issues for the medium and long term, and that's fine. Uh, but we have to recognize that we will not be able to resolve all issues uh, over the medium and long term in a two-day meeting. So, um, you know, we, we part the strategic issues, we note them so that we can work on them uh, in, in the coming years. A couple of minor issues, if possible, keep presentations and monologues to a minimum. <laughs> And, and the other principle which we encourage is uh, unnecessary affirmations of, of, you know, from people's speakers. So if, if you have something new to add to the conversation, that's great, uh, because we are quite pressed for time, and we have the uh, international broadcast as well. So any questions around the aims? Does that make sense? Well, 
we are on time. So this is the, uh, the part of the meeting where we do the participant introductions. And another tradition of OBRU meetings is we follow the two breath rule. And so what that means is, is that, hi, I'm Wayne McIntosh, I work at the OBR Foundation. <gasps> One breath. <laughs> right. And the second breath is if, if you could share something, uh, you know, about the OBRU or, or something that you, you know, you hope for the OBRU or what you'd like to get out of this meeting, you know, just a, a personal reflection or, or sharing. But the purpose for the two breath rule, of course, is we have, you know, 26 participants and we need to get the introductions done within an hour. So that is, you know, it's a little over two minutes per, um, per participant in terms of the introductions. Does it make sense? Okay. And uh, I welcome the colleagues that arrived uh, here uh, via the executive office. So you've had a good, uh, you bet that I haven't seen the executive office yet, so that, that's all good. Welcome, Dave. Welcome, Martin. Was there anybody else that I? Fantastic. Okay, so let's start with the introductions, and I shall be a benevolent dictator. And we'll, we'll start at this table here with the old boys. I guess that's the word. <laughs> Congrats, right? Well, first of all, it's time. Wait, I've got to come up Okay, first one. Great to be here. Fantastic to be back. Uh, Urban DeVries from Thompson Rivers University, where we've been involved in this for, from the very beginning, and I am the interim associate vice president for the Open Learning Division at Open Learning. That's it. I'm Rajit Jandiani. I'm a psychology faculty at uh, Portland Polytechnic University in Vancouver, BC. Um, passing on regrets from our president, Alan Davis, who couldn't be here for this convocation. Um, but thrilled to be part of what I think is sustainable, student-centered, credit-bearing open education. Thanks, Rajiv. Uh, Brian Lamb, Thompson Rivers University. Uh, this is my fourth meeting, and I'm struck by all the high-profile international so-called open uh, course initiatives that have squandered hundreds of millions of dollars and are now pivoting into corporate training. And the process that has merged through here, which is very open, very grassroots based, and building on substance and what we actually need for our institutions. The other thing I just wanted to say is I've co convened the technology working group with Dave Lane, and I'm looking forward to thinking about how some of the cool stuff he's been working on can be incorporated into our partner institutions. It's going to feel like TRU is taking over. I'm, I'm also from Thompson Rivers University, uh, Brenda Thompson, actually, and Associate Dean in the Faculty of Arts. And my first time joining this group um, because mainly when we start getting into the credentialing side, the credentialing of someone seeking a certificate in general studies would come across my desk. That's what I do. Part of my job is graduating audits, so that's why I'm here. Hmm. Uh, Andy Van, the Vice Chancellor and President of Charles State University. Um, I'm, we're a newer partner in OERU, but I think it's a really interesting model that I really hope we can make work. Uh, a much more interesting form of disruption than the hundreds of million dollars spent on MOOCs. And, and I have to say, as a newer partner, one of the fewer who's actually completed the first yes. course. Oh, yes. So um, yes. I do need to acknowledge that, and it's, it's a welcome contribution to the network. Given you know, you know, conditions of Australia, which kind of reflects part of the international nature of this collaboration. So thanks, Andy. Hi, I'm Judy O'Connell. I'm at Charles Sturt University. I'm one of three um, academic leads in online learning in the quality learning and teaching program we've got happening, and I'm involved in developing the next round of offerings for OERU, which is going to be good. Thanks, Judy. Martin, if we can shift to your table. Okay, thank you. Um, Morning to everyone, I'm Martin Westerton from Northwest University in South Africa. Um, also my fourth meeting and I'm looking forward to, especially I think hearing about the plans around the, the uh, development of the General Studies program. I think it's really exciting and just speaking to that <coughs> earlier, I think that it's now reaching critical mass. So it's exciting to see that development. And uh, thanks of course, uh, host of the OERU partners meeting last year. I'm Mark Singer. I'm uh, Vice Provost um, for the Center for the System of Learning at Thomas Edison State University in New Jersey. Um, this is my third meeting. Um, and uh, we've done a lot of uh, different kinds of things with uh, OER, but this, uh, being part of OER has been helpful to us in helping us really keep 
your focus on what's important. We really appreciate it. How, how much you've able to, been able to stay on track since since I joined. Thanks, Robert. Steve Phillips, also from Tom Sessions State University. I'm assistant director of the Center for Assessment Learning. Um, and kind of just to echo what Mark said, you know, it's, it's a nice opportunity to come here and meet you all and get to know you and kind of dive a little deeper into this consortium. Good morning, Christine Wallace, and also the provost and vice president of academic at Thompson Rivers University. Uh, the beautiful Cam Loops that I was gorgeous as you pronounced this this morning. This is my first OERU meeting. Uh, and the thing that I'm looking forward to is how we actually operationalize our aspirations, and particularly from a student experience, a student experience and from a quality assurance perspective. Yeah. Absolutely. Important priorities for our work. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Cindy Ives. I am Vice President of Academic at Athabasca University in Canada. Um, this is my first meeting, although Athabasca has been ably represented by Rory over the years, and we were a founding partner of OERU. As a marginal OER champion at Athabasca University, my job in the next little while is to bring into the perspective of open educational resources our new president who starts next Tuesday. Thanks, Cindy. Maxim Jean-Louis, I work at Contact North in Ontario, Canada. I am particularly interested in opportunities for the 600 small and remote communities that we serve. Thanks, Maxim, and welcome to your first meeting, and I hope there will be many more. Absolutely. Uh, good morning, everybody. Brianne and Tinsley, uh, academic registrar here at the University of the Highlands and Islands my first OER meeting, so delighted to meet you all. Uh, I have particular interest in um, the certification, the quality assurance aspects of the minimum viable product launch. Um, hello everyone, I'm Andy Brown. I'm also from UHI where I'm the head of academic development and I'm uh, involved in the OERU research opportunity. Hi everybody, <clears throat> I'm Becca Black, I work at Otago Polytechnic in Dunedin, New Zealand, and I'm here representing the Chief Executive because he's busy with organizational restructure at the moment. Um, my role at Otago Poly is the manager of OP Online, which is the group of about 11 developers who put learning online, either in blended or fully online courses, including OERU courses. So my commitment to this is to try to work out a way to take any course that's being developed for fully online or blended and put it up on OERU at the same time. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mustafa Hassan. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Hamdan bin Mohammed University, the first online university in the Middle East and Dubai. Uh, we are, uh, this is my first uh, uh, participation, and uh, the participation is mainly because we see this is a very important opportunity, not only for Dubai, but uh, because we are aiming to spread across the Middle East and uh, in other countries where uh, uh, higher education is far, far below the, uh, the norm. So we are here to learn and participate and take forward this to other uh, countries in the Middle East. Thank you, and wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Um, my name is David Paul. Um, I'm from the um, University of Southern Queensland in Australia. Um, he's been a uh, partner in the OERU from its, um, pretty much from its inception. Uh, and this is my fourth um, partners meeting. I unfortunately missed the one in Northwest University last year, and that was a great loss. But um, it's good to. I'd like to follow up on Martin's comment that I think you know um, the OERU is getting to the point where we finally have an MVC to move forward with, and that's excellent. I think that after these meetings this week, um, it's uh, you know, we'll move forward back into this one to achieve the overall goals. OERU. Thanks, David. Okay, 
Yeah. I'm Gary Campbell, um, the dean of one of the two faculties here at the university, and assistant principal for curriculum enhancement. I've been involved with blended learning as a teacher through to being a manager for about 20 odd years, and we've made lots of mistakes and lots of successes here. I guess I'm looking at this uh, as an extension of what we currently do, looking at the future. And I guess I'm here as a sort of highly supportive skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> we like this. <laughs> How about a highly skeptical supporter? <laughs> 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 okay, uh, Rob, shall we start here with you? Uh, okay, thanks. Good morning. Uh, I'm Rob Farron. I'm a research fellow at the Open <coughs> University in the UK. Um, I do a lot of work on OER projects, so currently I work on the OER Hub project, GoGN network, which is um, a network for PhD students working in open education, and also the OER World Map. Um, so I've got a lot of different OER things going on. Uh, I'm actually standing in today for Martin Weller, so this is my first OERU meeting. And I'm looking forward to learning more about what OER is up to, actually, because I don't know that much, if I'm honest. Um, and also to talk with you a bit later as well about research in the field and the kind of things you might uh, like to see from research in the field. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Rory. Uh, Rory McGrail. I'm from Athabasca University in Canada, and uh, I'm a member of the board of the OER Foundation. And uh, I'm looking forward to us getting our first courses out there and uh, uh, being able to provide free education to large numbers of students. Hi, I'm Pete Cavill. I'm from the Open University UK as well. This is my first meeting at OERU. I'm actually standing in for Andrew Law, who would, is, sorry, is not able to be here. Andrew and I are co-directors of a, a, a Scottish project, Opening Educational Practices in Scotland, which uh, I'm, I'm the kind of the Scottish end of that. Uh, Andrew is the uh, only UK end of, end of the project. And uh, there'd be, there's quite a lot of things that we've learned during the course of the last two years of the project in Scotland, uh, working with the whole sector, universities and colleges, which I think is, has been really useful. And I, I hope I can chip in a bit of that. Yeah, we're I mean, watching with keen interest the developments of you know open Scott OER Scotland and things that are happening here. Yeah. Welcome. Good morning, my name is Stephanie Chu. I'm the uh, Vice Provost Teaching and Learning at Portland Polytechnic University. And this is my first meeting. Um, I'm fairly new to my position, so part of my portfolio is to actually really support some initiatives within KPU. I know through uh, Rajiv and our president's uh, leadership over the past few years. See that cool. Um, they've, they've really taken it ahead in terms of uh, our work in KPU, so I'm now trying to figure out what I can do to better support it within our institution and beyond. So thank you. <coughs> so you're busy with the introductions, so let me hand that over. Uh, I'm Frank Rennie, the best of sustainable rural development at the University of Hamilton Islands. Uh, I live in based in the Hebrides, which I just called for claim. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> very much involved in online and teaching on research developments. Um, sustainable development to me is about getting the quality out to people far away from cities that don't have to come into big buildings. Yeah, all professors. Yeah, and uh, my partner, Brian Christchurch, <laughs> I'm probably the only non educator here, but I'm Dave Lane from the OER Foundation. I'm the open source technologist, and I'm in charge of. Um, Theory, at least keeping uh, the lights on, um, and I spend a fair bit of time going like this. And I um, work as part of the OER Foundation in Christchurch, New Zealand. And uh, Dave would like also to mention he's also president of the New Zealand Open Source Software Society. And you know, true to open, our entire technology stack runs on open, uh, free and open source software, uh, and, and it's a values based decision. Anyone in the world should be able to have the freedom to replicate the technologies that we are using uh, to support OER, and it's something we take quite seriously. And by that token, it means the te te uh, technology infrastructure we use, you can replicate at your own institutions if you find uh, find them beneficial. And part of being part of this network is we share the recipe, so to speak, 
of how we set these things up. Um, and uh, you know, that's an important benefit of you know, this collaboration that we're working with. So I'll tell you more about that shortly. Yeah. I have to say this is uh, the, the nerve-wracking session of this meeting because I always worry about getting this done on time. We stay on schedule with the um, you know the international meeting. So I do thank you for your succinct uh, introductions. I do appreciate that. So we are actually on time, a little bit ahead of time, which is a good thing. Which is a good thing. So what I'm going to do now is move on to the next uh, session of the agenda, where we will take a look at uh, a, a brief history of the OERU, particularly for those, if it's your first meeting, uh, this is just a high level overview of where we've come from, uh, the major decisions and milestones uh, of, of, of the last couple of years. So the OER Foundation was uh, established in 2009. Our mission as a charitable organization is really to provide networking, leadership and support to education institutions to achieve their strategic objectives using open education approaches. That's basically what we do at the foundation. We are entirely independent, uh, we are self-funded, uh, and 76% of our revenue stream comes from membership contributions. So we really value your contribution to moving this uh, agenda forward, and I thank you for that. Um, we have two flagship initiatives, uh, or in fact, Three flagship initiatives. One is we host the Wiki Educator Project, which is a collaboration of some 80,000 educators around the world who are assembling uh, you know, OERs in a collaborative fashion. And the other project is, of course, the OERU, which is our main flagship initiative, which we are you know, discussing here. I'll talk about our other initiative in a moment. So back in November uh, 2010, uh, I was speaking at the same conference that Emeritus Professor Jim Taylor from the University of Southern Queensland, who many of you will know, and he was also presenting there, and he was talking about open scholarship, and I was talking about the things that the OER Foundation was doing, and how we were planning to widen access to more affordable education opportunities. And uh, you know, discussing at this meeting, that is where the sort of this concept of the OERU was first mooted by you know, the two of us at that particular meeting. And we said, well, why don't we host an open international meeting to see if this idea has got traction? And with a little funding support from UNESCO, the regional office for the Pacific States, we were able to convene the first meeting in, on the 23rd of February, um, 2011 in Dunedin. And it's not that I have an immaculate memory, it's just that that was the day after the Christchurch earthquakes. And so half the participants who were going to attend the meeting were unable to be at the meeting because of Christchurch Airport being shut down, because Christchurch Airport is a major hub in terms of getting to the deep south. But nonetheless, we were able to broadcast the meeting live. We had up to 200, plus 200 virtual participants. And we basically decided this is a good idea. Let's start planning it. We had initial planning discussions. At that particular meeting, we discussed the framework which we were using to structure the planning. And the second uh, important facet or the important decision we took at that particular meeting was the decision to implement the SIP evaluation model, the context, input, process, and product evaluation. Uh, and we have actually completed the context evaluation. The input evaluation was completed and discussed at the last year's partners meeting. And at this meeting, we are initiating planning for the process evaluation. So those are the connections where these, uh, the evaluation model is coming from. The inaugural meeting of founding anchor partners was hosted uh, in November of the same year, again in Dunedin. Uh, 13 institutions had signed up by November that year. Uh, to join the OERU network and we commenced our planning. The key decisions that came out of that meeting was the agreement to focus initially on a Bachelor of General Studies as the first exit credential for the network. Uh, we also agreed to adopt a prototyping model, which is very open sourcey in, in a sense, is we build small prototypes, we test them out in the field, 
see how they work with a you know, tight feedback loop uh, to refine both the technologies we are using, uh, but also the, the pedagogy um, that we're using. I recall at that meeting, uh, Rory heeded an important warning, and that was not to uh, dictate any pedagogy whatsoever. And that has become a kind of a founding principle uh, of the OERU. And I think in part uh, has been one of the reasons for our success is recognizing the freedom and the autonomy of academics to implement appropriate pedagogies without trying to be prescriptive. So that was the, uh, the first the founding part of this meeting. We then uh, hosted the launch of the OERU. We, at uh, Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, which was the second meeting of the OERU partners. We were very fortunate to have Sir John Daniel, who many of you will know as one of the leading uh, sort of uh, thinkers around open distance learning to officiate at the opening. And the key decisions that came uh, out of that meeting in Kamloops was, this is in fact where we first proposed the notion of micro courses. And we'll, begin, we'll be speaking a bit more about that in a little more detail in the meeting around this micro course model. But that's really an issue of international course articulation. Because in different parts of the world, we, we use different course sizes, so to speak. So in Australia, most degree courses are roughly about 160 notional learning hours. New Zealand's 150. North, North America's 120 notional learning hours. UK typically 200 hours uh, any uh, course size, about 200, 200 hours. So you see it's an interesting um, phenomenon. So we've got to figure out how this articulation works. And so the micro courses are, are part in, of that solution because if you break it down into chunks about 40 notional learning hours, the building blocks uh, are easier to get these things to fit. So that, that's the rationale behind it. But of course, working with micro courses opens up other interesting opportunities around the potential for micro credentials and how they potentially relate to uh, you know, transcript credit. So those are one of the things we'll be thinking about at this meeting as well. Um, the, the other significant decision taken at that meeting was in fact the implementation of the organizational structure we use in this distributed OERU model. And I think Erwin, you convened the group that uh, made the proposal from memory, and I think the proposal was getting it done, right? Um, and how we work in the OERU is we have, we have working groups that focus on particular areas of building this, this collaboration. Uh, and each of the chairs of these working groups uh, uh, work also form part of the OERU management committee. All our meetings are conducted openly and transparently in the wiki. Anybody is able to, uh, you know, to participate. And I have to say the, 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 the structures have been working reasonably well to, you know, today in moving us forward. But the beauty of this organizational structure, it, it is quite agile because if a working group is not needed because we've done our work, uh, we then move on to this, you know, establishing the working groups we need for various components of our work. <coughs> So those, that was the origin of the working group structure, and I've already mentioned uh, Sir John's opening. We also uh, hosted a meeting, to, our very first meeting, to think about uh, transnational qualifications and course articulation, which was hosted by the Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver. And they've actually done quite a bit of work with the virtual university for, small, uh, for the small island states and actually have produced a transnational qualifications framework, uh, which is sort of a high level framework to help us understand levels, credits, and these kinds of things. And fortunately, it's openly licensed. And um, that has guided the thinking uh, in the development of our own uh, course articulation guidelines, which are modeled to a large extent on BC CAT system, uh, Brenda, you, you would be able to uh, confirm that. Um, and, and, and that's where those decisions were taken. Uh, we also realized at, the, uh, at, at, at this phase that uh, at this phase, one of the things that we really need to get right is the strategic planning component of the OERU. And in fact, 
This, we uh, established the OERU Council of Chief Executive Officers, uh, and the first meeting was hosted by, uh, by KPU. And really, the, 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 the Council of CEOs is, is an assembly of senior leaders you know, that are called together to actually discuss strategic futures and help guide the, the OERU in its, you know, in its journey uh, into the future. So at that particular meeting, the uh, terms of reference were agreed and an executive committee of that council was established and there are uh, vice chairs for each of the regions and currently the vice chairs are um, Alan Davis is, is chair of the council, Martin, you are the deputy chair for Africa, Phil Kerr is deputy chair for Oceania region, and Clive Holland is the deputy chair for Europe, uh, and I think that's the last thing, Martin, have I left anyone else? No. Okay. And the, uh, the Council of CEOs convenes every year after this meeting. And I'll point this out to you in a moment, but there, there is a running document we keep in this meeting that if during any one of your breakout sessions, an item which you're discussing, which you feel should be tabled at the CEO's meeting, should be noted in the wiki on that particular page. And we actually assemble the agenda for the CEO's meeting based on the inputs from this meeting. Okay, so that's how the, how, how the process flows. And the executives, later on in the agenda, the executives that are here will have a small breakout group also just to brainstorm and sharpen up that agenda for our discussions on at the council CEO's meeting, just in terms of process and how that works. Our third project is, of course, we host Creative Commons Aotearoa New Zealand, which is the national uh, affiliate of Creative Commons. Um, just to, uh, to clarify, this is run as an independent, ring-fenced, self-funded project. No OERU membership fees go to supporting Creative Commons New Zealand, because that would not be wise to, a wise way of spending your money. Yeah. So I just wanted to make that clear. The third meeting of OERU Partners was hosted by the University of uh, Tasmania in Hobart, and I see a good number of faces who were present at that meeting. Um, at, at the third meeting, we approved the strategic plan for 2015 to 2017 that had gone through an extensive consultation process prior to the meeting. And we, at that meeting, we actually focused on calibrating the KPIs for the, you know, the strategic plan, our first uh, strategic plan. We also tabled the very first draft uh, of the OBRU guidelines for credit transfer and course articulation. Um, and, and as you will appreciate, I mean, that's, that's the real engine of the OBRU. And we've been spending a lot of time and a lot of thinking and a lot of consultation in helping to move that process forward. We also reviewed the plan for the input evaluation. You remember I mentioned using the SIP evaluation model, so that's where we had a look at the approvals or the input evaluation. The second meeting of the Council of CEOs was hosted by the University of Wollongong's uh, Sydney campus. Uh, the strategic plan was endorsed at that meeting. And uh, the, another, another important decision was the institution of um, institutional action plans. And so the, the, the concept is that every year we put out uh, institution action plans to the partner members where they choose and nominate where they are going to spend their time. Because part of the OVRU model is that each partner contributes uh, roughly 0.2 FTE in terms of staff time by their work and engagement in the OVRU. And it's really just a way of helping to coordinate how that time is actually spent you know, productively across the network. An important principle of the OERU, and I think this has been a prime reason for our success to date, is that our partner institutions retain decision-making autonomy over all aspects of the OERU. And I think that's very, very important. We at the Foundation don't dictate, for example, how that time is spent or what you prioritize locally in your own institutions, right? 
Um, however, we try to coordinate uh, to avoid you know, duplication of effort and you know, maximize the impact for the network uh, through that institutional action planning process. Moving on then, uh, our first graduate, uh, Michelle Aragon. Uh, so what, where this came about is the University of Southern Queensland developed uh, one of the first prototype courses, Regional Relations in Asia and the Pacific. <coughs> and we ran and taught this course online. Michelle participated in this course. She was assessed by, by the University of Southern Queensland and her credit was applied to a credential at Thompson Rivers University within the existing policies and procedures at Thompson Rivers University. While we don't have a large number of graduates, this is an important milestone because it shows that the system and the policy in fact works. I'm also aware there have been a couple of students that have completed the, the logic course. No, for you. Yeah, so maybe you just want to um, quickly summarize what that's about? Well, I don't want to, you know, oh, okay. over, uh, you know, shadow that, but uh, all right. Um, well, uh, so so we, uh, we we took uh, UNISA's uh, course in um, uh, critical reasoning uh, at Thomas Edison, and, and, and we adapted it, um, uh, sort of as, as you were noting before, Wayne, uh, in, in each country, the, the length of the course and the expectations for the course are different, so we had to modify this to, to suit the U.S. model. And uh, we've got it available as an open course that students can uh, do in a self-paced manner. Um, we also offer it with a, a mentor facilitator, if you will, one of our, what we call our faculty, basically. And then um, we have a, a third option, which is the, the assessment. It's a uh, essentially a credit by exam um, model. So students can go through the self-paced model, then take the, in our parlance, it's a TSEP, Tom Edison exam program. Uh, and so we've had uh, a number of students complete the self-paced course, take the TSEP exam, and earn credit. And I, I believe uh, it's 40 or 50 that did not take our course, and then an additional uh, number that have. And so for, uh, it's a pretty nominal fee, um, about $100, um, students can earn credit. Thanks, Rob. The other thing that we do is we, we try and host, uh, we just don't see those people are running or not. <laughs> so they're not running, this is a, a, a drill. They look like they're very relaxed. Everybody ignores it. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty much tea time. <laughs> we also try and host regional meetings. Uh, we've had two regional meetings, one in Oceania, one in North America, which has developed the OERU Open Business Model. And you have a copy of the OERU Open Business Model on your desk. Uh, I think this is a significant document because it actually shows how uh, the OERU is fiscally sustainable. Moving on then to last year's uh, regional meeting uh, held at Northwest University. The key decisions that were taken there were, of course, the unanimous approval of the OERU guidelines for credit transfer and course accumulation, and our credit accumulation. We agreed to uh, work on producing an OERU first year of study leading to an exit award as minimum viable product. And of course, I'll work on recalibrating the plan. The CDO's meeting, uh, the terms of reference were expanded to include advice, guidance, and support on implementing OERU within, uh, within the institutions. Um, of course, the distribution of the open business model, which was done and the endorsement of our focus on developing the first year of study. And ladies and gentlemen, we shall break for tea. Uh, <laughs> returning at uh, what time? It's made at 11.20. Returning at 11.20.
And I believe uh, she is Susan. 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 Oh, we hit of ourselves. That's even better. <laughs> Oh no, that's, that's even better. Uh, we're not ready for tea. I'm taking the shot back. Yeah. Uh, let's just have a look here. Yeah, so that we've done. That we've done. Yeah. That we've done. Yeah. That's your good time. Yeah. Your good time. So any, any questions relating to sort of our history, where we've come from, is there anything you don't quite uh, understand or anything you want to know about how things have gone or where we're coming from yet? Yeah, just, just from your perspective, if you don't mind, would you say that there's been much of a change in the mission or the direction of OERU since its beginnings? I mean, has there been much evolution in, in any direction? I think it's a very good question. Um, I think we've stayed true to our mission, and the mission of OERU is really about widening access to more affordable pathways of learning. Um, so I, I think we have remained true to our mission. I think we've become real, uh, a tad more realistic in our objectives in terms of, you know, when we started off, we were going to have all these degrees and you know, all these wonderful things. We were quite excited about it, and when we started working, we began to realize, well, we going to have to do a lot of planning, a lot of thinking. Uh, but the core mission has, has, remained, has remained there. And, and to be honest, if, if only our youth, for example, were only able to do a first year of study, just hypothetically, and do that well, right? And we are able to help point, you know, point one percent of those learners who will be denied access to tertiary education over the next you know, 10 years, that's a million people we have helped. And that's meaningful. Of course, uh, if we do more, there's more meaning. <laughs> but yeah, I think the, uh, the other thing uh, that has been extremely helpful is we've used an incremental design approach insofar as the technology is concerned. So we didn't use the, the, the kind of the big cathedral planning model to figure out, okay, we're going to do this amazing thing, and we've spent three years researching you know, what technology we're going to do this with, and then you know, enforce it on everybody. The way that we've done work, with, particularly on the technology side, has been very incremental. Taking small steps, testing that, seeing what works, refining it. Uh, and I think we've, we've, we've come up with a model that is very, very powerful uh, in very, very interesting ways for on-campus learners. I think that's part of the, the value of this network is the whole notion of smart philanthropy. This thinking that you know, the ideas and things that we learn from doing what we do in this open space, with open design, open technologies, and then cherry pick the valuable things that would actually work on campus as well. So I think that I hadn't realized and anticipated at the onset how important that component was going to become. I mean, I was, I mean, you all know I'm a bit of an open source kind of geek. Well, not so much a geek, but I, I like open, free and open source software for good reasons. And I was surprised at the last partners meeting where the, the CEOs were requesting uh, guidance and advice and thinking about the implementation of open source technologies on campus. That was a, a surprise for me. I, I didn't expect that uh, as, a, as a benefit of the network. Um, for yourself, Tom? No, I, I, I would agree with you. I, I think it would be difficult for us to stay with the exact same goals that we had uh, when it was launched you know, several years ago, especially because the context is changing and the idea of open has been changing. But at the same time, there is a kind of a adherence to this, uh, this pure idea of open that uh, you don't see from any other places. I mean, there are a lot of other organizations calling what they do open or, or claiming to be providers of open materials, and they're not. And it's, it's nice to have this stay true to the original principles, even though, as you say, we're able to, we're, we need to adapt to uh, the changes you know, in the world. Yeah, and, and in hindsight, I think that it was a good decision we took when we implemented the, kind of, yeah. the collaboration. One of the principles of engagement was free cultural works approved licensing. 
uh, you know, for, for the course material. Of course, you can point to any open access materials that are there, but our core engine remains open uh, in, in, in all its facets, which means it's replicable. And so, that, so we've got to think smartly about what does this mean from a business perspective? Because if anybody can replicate what we do, right? <coughs> what are the implications for our own strategic planning as individual institutions? And I think there are a number of significant benefits. And why this network will have the staying power is because of that. Uh, I would hesit, you know, hesitate to guess that there's no sort of commercial operation <coughs> that would be able to replicate the efficiencies of our cost structures. They can't. So, yeah, just about at the same time that uh, that OERU launched its its uh, initial um, presence concept, that's pretty much at the exact same time that the big MOOC phenomenon, the, the uh, ex MOOC phenomenon, kind of came, you know, showed up. And uh, do you think there uh, definitely is a different concept from from what we saw emerging through that Brian talked about earlier? That the big investments in large uh, infrastructures and, and a lot of the hype that came around that. This is quite a different concept. To, to what extent do you think um, we've been able to maintain the, sort of the general understanding of what this concept is as opposed to the broader MOOC idea, which I think has pretty much overtaken the, the uh, open uh, concept, probably a lot of people's minds. Again, I mean, I think it's a very good question. And it's a kind of discussion we, I did. It would be great if we could have for a couple of hours because I think there are a number of significant differences between what we are doing when compared to the commercial you know, MOOC providers. Uh, I mean, one key difference is all our courseware is uh, OER. It's, it's open. There, there are a few peripheral uh, sort of MOOCs that you know, have open licensing, but everything we do is open. And another significant difference, I think, and it might seem trivial, right? But is no OERU learner will be denied access to the learning materials for having to register a password. So any, and this is a values-based commit, commitment in the OERU, any learner must be able to access the materials without having to register a password. And that has a number of implications for the technologies you use and how you do uh, in learning analytics, and, and we're busy unpacking these kind of issues, right? And it's extremely valuable. And it, it struck a day when I were at the regional meeting uh, at USQ, and for the first time I realized, in fact, apart from the values of openness, right, how important this potentially is for indigenous learners, first and family learners, who would be able to participate in learning, sort of kind of, sort of the try before you buy sort of thing. Uh, and fail anonymously. And that is very powerful. And I, had, I, had, I hadn't realized it before, you know, how, how valuable that, just the component that, you know, if you want to try your learning, uh, you can do that. You can take as long as you like. That's powerful. That's been a significant difference. The other uh, major difference, and, and uh, Brian, you've uh, uh, you done quite a bit of, you know, research on this is the whole open design model. Uh, we actually use an open design and consultative model for the design and development of the courses. And, and it gives us the flexibility to you know, easily have, and we have had a number of courses where we have designers and developers of different backgrounds working from five different locations on the planet. And that requires you know, thinking about well, what systems do you use, how do you communicate, how do you know, so we're building up that tested knowledge with, you know, with you know, our organization of how to do this. Uh, and we provide not doing that. Uh, we will be ahead of the game uh, in that space. Uh, I think we were also prudent and wise not to try and, you know, when, when all the hype was happening, we didn't attempt to try and rebrand ourselves as, as MOOCs. Even though our delivery model is open online courses, that's our delivery model. I think you know that was a wise decision. I mean, we, 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 we focused on what we're doing, carrying on, flying below the radar, uh, but we're doing real stuff that is going to help real people. The other area, and I, I'm hoping we can have some discussion on this at this meeting, which I think is the 
strategic point of difference of what we are doing and the potential of what we're doing is in the area of what we call open boundary courses. So an open boundary course is where you've got your local course, right? For your full fee, full, you know, full support students on campus in your own learning management system. Learning in parallel with free OERU learners who don't get tutorial support from your, you know, from your system. And start thinking about, well, how does it work if five of our partners are teaching the same course in this model? How, how very powerful that is. And that the commercial providers will not be able to do. And this is something that we can do. Our technology, in fact, is designed to enable us to do that with relative ease. And then the day becomes clear. For example, I mean, you would think, why would you want to do that as an institution? But one example might be if you are a regional uh, university or a polytechnic or whatever, you could market an international intercultural learning experience for your own learners, which is hard to replicate on a regional campus. So, um, and it's kind of thinking about, you know, where do those opportunities lie? And then, uh, Irwin, has that kind of been your experience? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, Matt, I think it's something, a message that we want to keep refreshing among ourselves. Yeah. Um, sort of some of these distinct characteristics uh, that make this a very accessible uh, project for those of us working in our institutions and, and others that want to join. The very low cost of, uh, of entry, so to speak, and um, and the way that uh, I think a lot of our processes can integrate with our existing process. It doesn't necessarily have to be something big and new, requiring a large investment, and requiring a, a lot of new infrastructure. It's more like there's an interest in getting involved. It's a pretty simple concept. I think that's a message that we need to know. It's not this massive thing. It's just something we need to start doing. And, and if it's something we believe in as institutions, something we want to participate in, it's not difficult. It's, it's very grassroots. Uh, and, and it also, uh, I, I've seen in our own institution, for a number of colleagues here have participated in this, uh, a lot of learning takes place. It's a very, it's probably the best education you could possibly get. In, working in open education resources and open education educational practices. And it filters out through many different levels of our institution, the way we design our programs, to the way we, we give credit to programs, to the way we assess learning in a more informal space, to the way we design our programs, uh, bringing in more collaborative models rather than just working in little isolated caves. Um, so it, put, it forces a lot of questions on our institutions that I think are really good questions that we should be asking if we want to be operating in. In, in a more open manner from, from what we've been doing in the past and breaking on proprietary mindsets. Uh, at the same time, you know, counting on our, our on this partnerships uh, uh, roots as accredited and credible educational institutions, not necessarily startup businesses and so on, not, not to say anything against startups, but the idea that this is building out of the, the histories that we have as universities and college and institutes. Those are the pieces that, that, that uh, I find very uh, promising for the model. Yeah. It's, it's interesting on the quality, and this excludes TOU, of course, and QSQ, I mean, the other sort of work of courses. Like I'm saying this, but thank you. What I, what I noticed, I, I didn't expect this, is the radical transparency of our design and development model actually has improved quality. I mean, and folk who work in open online learning would know that because you can't hide behind the, you know, the walls of the lecture theatre. I mean, this is open. And so the whole discourse and the process of getting to that point, um, and uh, we, I, I can speak here of the Togo Polytechnic. I mean, the first uh, so prototype course that was finished around sustainable practice, the product was an order of magnitude better than anything that has been produced internally before because of, you know, how open this process is, because everybody can see it. And it's this thing that you know institutions don't want to you know, put a bad foot forward. And that's good and, and that's valuable. And, and, and it's kind of low risk for the institutions as well because it's only a two course contribution, right? This is not a full curriculum. Of course, institutions who want to take it further, they can. Um, it, 
the many opportunities. The other area which I forgot to mention was the significant difference is the technologies that we use, and this is the MOOC, the MOOC commercial MOOC providers might be able to do. Any partner institution in this network can plug in an OERU course and teach it locally for full paying students without spending a cent on development. Now, I don't really be a this you know, uh, but I trained as an accountant in my first life. <laughs> but I have to say, a business model where you're not paying for the inputs of your product is actually not bad business to be in. And that is possible. That is possible. So, this is an open question, genuine question. So, is the other, another differentiation between OERU and MOOCs is the level of disaggregation. So that's really what you're talking about here. The fact that you've got the learning is here and it's open, you don't pay for it. What you are paying for, and you can play with, you can try different models, is accreditation, the assessment, tutorial support, all those other things. <coughs> that is different from, I think, all moves I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably one of the ways that higher education will develop in the future. Yep. So it's there's a lot to, to play for there. I think that's one of the big differentiators. Yeah, and I'm absolutely right again. And I'm pleased you mentioned that um, the OERU model is a disaggregated service provision model. That's what it is. And so um, you know, different institutions can assemble services, and they can be people, you know, people service, right, uh, in different ways. Uh, and we purposely designed this thing in that way to be able to do that. And it's actually quite interesting if we look in our, our input evaluation shows two very distinct clusters or categories of partners within the network. There's a cluster of partners that are really just doing this for philanthropic reasons. You know, this is part of our you know, commitment to social justice or our uh, community service support. We're not interested in making any money. Um, there's a cluster around that. But there's another cluster within the group who sees the revenue stream potential for what this model enables. And again, that's something that's very powerful with our model. It, it doesn't exclude those, you know, those, those purposes, right? They actually support each other. Yeah. Not only does it not exclude them, it supports them. Yeah. Okay. Very good point, Rory. Yeah. Well, a good point from yeah. our skeptic here, too. <laughs> <laughs> Just to pick up on your point about quality too, and I'm looking at the uh, the Hack Education BLS Pigeon uh, sticker, mm -hmm. and how Audrey Waters wrote a lovely piece a yeah. couple of weeks back. Um, we've been having some, uh, I'll use the word that pops into my mind, interminable discussions about academic quality at our academic senate. And a lot of it has been two views of what quality means, but uh, a lot of it has been the kind of backlash from the academic community about managerialism. Sure. Yeah, liberal approaches to education. I, I think the really interesting prospect here is to establish a different sort of standardization, if you like, or a different sort of quality control, which does feel like it's being driven by the people who genuinely care about the education. Yeah. It's not being imposed from outside. And yeah. I think that's one of the really interesting possibilities about this. And to me, you know, to go on what, what could be additional in terms of bringing a genuine network of learners from across the world. And I think that's what the original stuff is so cool about what Vasco was trying to do with it was open, really open. <coughs> so you know I, I think it's a really interesting prospect here. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, and it's interesting that you should mention that Andy because one of the discussions at this meeting is focused on you know how do we set up an academic board? How how, how would something like that work in this sort of distributed network model? Kind of getting back to that sort of collegial quality perspective. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the open boundary course uh, potential early. So, uh, as a faculty member, but also as a as a course developer for the ORU for computers and for PPU, uh, I, I think I'm really interested in in, in moving beyond um, uh, sort of looking at this as, as uh, educational philanthropy. Um, and I think Irwin sort of glanced at this as well in terms of how much capacity is built by engaging in course development, simply in trying to design a course that can suit different, you know, informal learners who don't want credit, OERU, call, OERU students who will simply pay their apps of Procter and Fee and face to face students and how we can all live in the open web at the same time. The open boundary courses, I think, represents a great uh, possibility for, for our course development. 
as does, I think, seriously thinking about uh, open pedagogy-based assignments, uh, both in terms of um, pedagogical innovation for students, where they're contributing resources back to the commons as part well of these course assignments, but also as another recipe towards sustainability for the OER course development yeah. itself. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm really interested in seeing how this model is not just accessible, but also truly innovative uh, and sort of uh, promotes that within our organizations. Even more than that, it can actually promote innovation back in the contributing organizations because doing that doesn't come naturally for those academics. So it, it becomes a model. Yeah. No, okay. so I think the open boundary concept also creates a continuum between, for the standard course development delivery model and the open boundary. It can be anywhere in between. To remain a faculty member's control as to the extent to which the boundary opens up yeah. or remains because these resources are all open, uh, open li openly licensed, they can't be used in their own settings, open it up to other learners, or you can give it away, or you can take it and adapt it. And those are some of the really, I think, fascinating potentials of this model. There, there are, some people are uneasy with the idea of a disaggregated uh, learning model, um, and uh, I think it, it, it has to remain in such a way that. Wherever a faculty member who's engaging in this uh, wants to place himself, they continue to do that. Exactly, yeah. I mean, this is it's not a prescriptive model, you know, it's sip and dip and use what works, right? Yeah. May I add something? Absolutely. Um, what, what I have found at Otago Polytechnic is that it's not a hard sell to get faculty members to incorporate this open model. Um, in terms of, of this, sorry, my brain is still sort of halfway between here and here, so I'm blanking on the exact word you call open boundary. Mm -hmm. The thing is, some of them actually ask for it, but they don't use the language that we're used to hearing. So you have to hear what they're actually asking for. Right. But they'll use words almost that sound magical, you know, like open up my classrooms. So People can drop in and from all over the world. So you just have to hear the concept, and mm -hmm. you know, then you can identify this. Yes, this is what they're asking for. Yeah. And they are asking for it. So that's why I say it's not a hard sell. Right. I think the, the challenge that faces us right now is that we are really at the forefront of some new structures of learning and teaching and the, and the way we price things and the way we assemble things together. So this is our this is our opportunity. And and we, we have the freedom. We have agile freedom. I mean being this this sort of this network open organization, we have that agility. We can move very, very quickly in doing some very interesting things without high risk. Very interesting model. Yeah. Go ahead. I think it's important that yes, we can bring in all kinds of educational change. But we can also stay the same if we want. The, this is the agility is that if you don't want to change, if you don't believe in open practices, you can have a traditional base course, and that's just fine. And if you want to go helter skelter into open practices and new ideas in education, this supports it very well. It, more more so than the any conventional content model. Yep. It's a good point, Roy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I wouldn't want anyone to be to think that they have to make all these huge changes in order to uh, to participate in OERU. Exactly. Because you can keep your traditional model and do what you've always been doing, but now it's uh, free content and shared content for others. Mm -hmm. For those courses you want to. Yeah, that's all they're possible. Or yes. all or nothing model, yeah. yeah. Sorry, but I mean, people may know this already, but I'm quite new to this OER so here. So, this is an academic dating service for acquainting people with the sort of courses that are available in the Not yet, you know? Not yet. Exactly, we're kind of speaking about it. Uh, this is kind of the game. It's academic <laughs> dating, it's also learner dating. So, um, yeah. on that point, uh, the OER World Map project is essentially building the biggest like database of OER architects, um, things they do, where they do them, and so on. So, this is building a sort of infrastructure 
that will support those kind of queries at a future date. Um, but obviously, it's quite difficult to put everything into one place. So the idea is to build a sort of data model, then populate that. And then you'll have things like a calendar function running off it, so you'll see run the conferences, when do they clash, you know, who else is going, that kind of thing. So we're working towards that, basically. But there's no centralized point yet. But yeah, I, I guess it's part of our evolution process. We, we do need to get there. We become more, more efficient with that. I mean, there's, there's, there's a tension there, I think. Um, of course. Because obviously, part of the idea of being open to, to empowering to the individual, you can just kind of go off and do things. That's putting in a different direction to centralization, which would be required for that, I think. So. But I think, I think the big thing is it, it's, it's, it's around the freedom. Um, because you can have central systems that are not so free. And I think that's making more tense. Yeah. 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 yeah I was just going to say that uh, there's sort of a parallel in between this model of I perceive it. I mean, I'm coming into this uh, from the technology side, but there's a, there's a parallel between this and some of the technolo technological innovation that we've been seeing, where initial technology innovation is often done in a centralized model. Um, where everything is, is tightly uh, um, constrained in order to reduce the degrees of freedom and to reduce the risk from a commercial point of view. Um, whereas the open model always starts from the grassroots with a lot of trying to identify standard behaviors and then work out a model that allows a lot of different people to, um, without needing to seek permission or without needing to, to in any way uh, conform, they can choose to participate in a federated uh, organization where you couple the different different components together voluntarily rather than because you're you're forced to by the, the structure of the system. So this this I think is a much more resilient and stronger model. In fact, it's like it's essentially the internet model applied to education. Yeah, we have that model. We have a country champion network, so that's the federated structure we use for it. So. Okay. So just, uh, just wrapping up this session, the last thing I just wanted to highlight is um, that I think the We're still only going to drive this. Exactly. It's, it's interesting. We're actually using a video conference link, which is dialing into the room, which is managed at a remote location. Um, <laughs> so it's all working. <laughs> We'll see how this goes. We'll see how this goes. Oh, I don't I guess I so okay, the last thing I just want to cover. The last thing I just want to cover before we break for tea 
particularly for uh, newer uh, partners, and this is your first meeting, just to give you a sense of actually how this open planning works within our model. Uh, every, all our planning is conducted in the, uh, in the wiki, and in fact, all our meetings are recorded, so we're recording this session, and we, we will have a full digital history. And I admitted, I should, oh, this is terribly bad. I, I admitted to warn, warn the participants that uh, this meeting is recorded and it's broadcast live, as we can expect. Otherwise, sorry, sorry. But uh, what that means is anything and everything you say will be attributed to your digital history in perpetuity. <laughs> and it will be under an open license. <laughs> So I hope that's okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to. Yeah, now. We, this, the yeah, problem we're getting is we're getting into the yeah. version of the video stream, which is because we're sharing the thing that we're also looking at, and then we're sharing that again and so on and so on. So, 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 so yeah, we need to. Uh, <coughs> okay. But we're safe in this corner. You, you and there's good. no camera. No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> right there, I, can, I, can I, I did pan a little bit for yeah. uh, yeah. not too dirty. Yeah. 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 So basically what what I just wanted, wanted to show you is if you go back to our very first yeah. meeting yeah. of the OERU back in February 2011, we we discussed this framework for organizing the planning of the OERU. And we basically said there were a bunch of things that it makes sense for the collaboration to be doing. Things like open curriculum, open learning design and development, open pedagogy, open student support. Of course, a shared uh, you know, technology infrastructure is something that's worth doing together. And then there are things that individual institutions do, right? They, they're responsible for their open assessment services, open credentialing services, and open community service, right? And all that was, was an organizing framework to help us plan the implementation of this OERU. And so if you go to Wiki Educator and you go to the homepage of Wiki Educator, um, you'll see there's a link there to OERU planning. And then you arrive at this, this page, which is the planning hub. Now, if, if you're new to this sort of thing, you will get lost. Uh, it's it's the nature it's the nature of new things, right? <laughs> don't you know? Don't go into jump off the bridge mode. It's fine. It's normal. You will be confused. Okay, but think think of it realistically. When you join a new organisation, in the beginning it's hard. You know, you've got to know where all the buildings are. You've got to know what people do things. You don't know where you find all the policies. You don't know what the content of the policies are. This is no different from you know. Traditional organization. We, we are an organization. It's just that we're distributed and we're virtual and we're open, right? And so this is where all the planning happens. But in the parallel, I just wanted to remember those, those framework components open curriculum, open design and development, open pedagogy, all those things in that framework model is the structure we use for the planning and implementation of the OERU. And so all the projects relating you know, to whatever planning we're doing is listed from this patch. Um, you know, the other, you know, the other things that have been completed in that section. So we've got, we have this history of the organization since inception. You could, for example, you know, go to the meetings uh, and see all, you know, the meetings that have been, we've convened over the years. You could go back to the very first meeting and see, you know, what, you know, what decisions were taken. Um, there you go, there was the first meeting, summary of the meeting. There are the recordings and sessions of the meeting. We want a handful of organizations, in fact, I, I don't know of many organizations that have this level of open, transparent history since inception. This is going to make for interesting study and research, you know, one or two PhDs might climb into this and start seeing, you know, how is this thing evolved, this, I mean, the history is here, the full history is here. But, uh, given uh, the, the complexities of navigating the planning page and figuring out where to find things, 
a good place to start uh, is if you are a, a, a wee bit lost, is just to go to the quick links page here. And this is just a visualization of sort of the structure and where things sit. Now, I know the, those people that are well versed in design and layout are going to tell me that design is atrocious. You're absolutely right, it's atrocious. It's a wiki. Okay, this is a, it's a planning document. This, this is not a public website in that sense, right? But it gives you an idea of the, the structure of how this all sits, right? We have sort of the, the governments and the high, high level planning and management the active working groups, right? And you can click through to any one of those pages uh, and then you, you would actually see, for example, if I click through then to marketing, communications and marketing engagement. Um, it's just taking a while to load, I think. We'll click through there. You'll see TV. There is the and all the documentation that relates to that planning group. The record of all the meetings that have been held by that working group. Um, the key, the key performance objectives and, and KPIs that are related to that working group. So just a bit of a high level overview of how all this planning happens in, in the open. And as you become more familiar with this, the structure and how this all sits together, um, it starts making a lot more sense. And you'll see a bit later today, there are technologies that we have. If you are stuck and you need help, uh, there are many places you can ask. So I just wanted to put that out there. But it's a unique feature of our model. So with uh, without further ado, let, let us break for tea. And uh, we'll be back at 11.15. And please be back at 11.15 because of the broadcast. We have to start on time. So, um, we might hound you to come back to the room. But thank you very much. That's a very kind way of putting it.